If you're a subject matter expert, which is one of the stages on the way to being a trusted advisor, you know, we all started out as subject matter experts and we thought that I'm going to wow these people with my knowledge and I am going to come in there and I'm going to show them, talk about Roth conversions and all this kind of cool stuff, which is important. Don't get me wrong, but you hang your hat on the technical. What I've found is that you reach a point where the technical is table stakes. Mm -hmm. It's expected, mm -hmm. but what's not expected is your ability to develop that relationship so that you can put the technical to work in the most effective way for that client. That's what separates the trusted advisor, in my view, from just a, a transactional subject matter expert. Welcome Model FAs, David DeSell here, president of Model FA, and I'm excited about our guest today. As you've come to learn since the beginning of this year, we're going to go through some of our guests' background and extract some success principles along the way, then go through a topic or two that they're exceptionally gifted at and have been able to maximize in their life, go through their favorite book because I want to make sure that we're promoting learning both in and outside the industry. And then we'll head into the after hours portion where we get an opportunity to hear some embarrassing stories and try and do a good job of humanizing ourselves for all of you. That way we can build a relationship from afar. Um, so with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and introduce Chaz to you. So I'm going to introduce him through his formal bio that he sent over. With that being said, I'm going to give my own personal bio shortly thereafter. So Chaz is a principal well Wealth Manager and Chief Visionary Officer at Madeira Wealth Management. His role as a wealth manager includes helping clients to develop their financial plans, implement wealth management strategies, and manage clients' investment portfolios. In addition to his work with clients, Chaz helps to drive the strategic direction for the firm in his role as Chief Visionary Officer. In his professional experience, he's a nationally recognized as a trusted resource for complex financial issues faced by high net worth individuals and institutions, a pioneer in the use of Monte Carlo simulations in financial planning, has published and spoken regularly on the topic of Monte Carlo and financial planning. During his more than 30 years in the investment management industry, he's been a featured speaker at national conferences, including JP Morgan Wealth Management Conference, the Financial Planning Association, and the DFA Advisors College. Uh, Chaz and his team joined Madeira actually uh, just a handful of months ago in January. January 2021. Prior to Madeira, Chaz led Independence Advisors' strategic direction and portfolio management process. He earned the CFA designation, which is highly respected by the global financial industry for its rigorous focus on current investment knowledge, analytical skill, and ethical standards. Chaz received his bachelor's in economics from the Pennsylvania State University. He is a member of the New York Society of Curity Analysts, the CFA Society of Philadelphia, the Wealth Management Council, and the CFA Institute. Outside of Madeira in his free time, Chaz enjoys studying military history, spending time with his family, and of course, which we'll be diving deeper into today, fly fishing. Chaz also hosts a podcast called The Wealth Cast. So now that I made it through that bio, so Chaz, I'm proud to say that we've become friends from afar. Chaz, and his firms are clients of ours over at Model FA. And I'm going to do my best to get Chaz to brag a little bit about his success up to this point. But I will say he's very humble in his success. Quite frankly, one of the nicest people that I've met in the industry and grateful for the opportunity to have him on the show. So without further ado, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's very kind of you. Awesome. Awesome. So I feel like there's a lot to unpack. So Bring us back to the very beginning. So you mentioned that you've been in the industry for about 30 years. How did you actually get started within our industry? Well, once I graduated from Penn State, a lot of folks that was that were graduating or that do graduate from university, I was looking for something to do. And, and I had an interest in economics. And my grandfather had a relationship with Kidder Peabody, had an account there. So I knew something about Kidder Peabody through them and talking to them about stocks, et cetera. So I wandered into the local Kidder Peabody office and, and got a job. And it was you know just an incredible firm in those days very entrepreneurial we could do investment banking we could do retail client advising we could do institutional advising so it gave me the opportunity to experience all of those things at a young at an early stage of my career it was really formative awesome now at what point in time did you venture off to starting independence advisors how far along in your career i was around 30 30 years old at the time 
So I'm 58, so you can do the math. And uh, it really was the result of as good a firm as Kidder Peabody was and as good as the experience I had in the brokerage industry, there was, in my view, at any rate, there was an inherent conflict of interest with the clients. And so in 1993, there was an opportunity to start an advisory firm using Schwab as a platform and start to embrace that fiduciary responsibility that you hear so much about today. It wasn't as um, as well known in those days, but that's the reason we started. And that's why we called the firm Independence Advisors, just to be independent thinkers, independent advocates for our clients. And that's, that's really the start. Now, when you actually ventured off? Was it you and a partner? Was it you and a staff person? Like, What did those very beginning years look like? How'd you duct tape this thing together? It was uh, myself, one of the folks that I worked with in the previous firm and partner named Jim Brown, who I was partners with until about 2010 when he retired. And it was, we started from scratch. I mean, we had limited resources, let's say that. We were sort of making it up as we went along because it was all new. In those days, the independent RAA model was still relatively unknown. And so it required a lot of innovation and R&D to try to figure out, okay, what's the best way to go about doing this for our clients? We had the good fortune of meeting Dimensional very early. We had the good fortune of having the ability to talk to Jack Bogle at Vanguard. At an early stage, he was very influential. Dimensional was very influential. And uh, fortunately, we're sort of born of those two organizations. Now, did you like bring over clients with you from the previous firm? Like what did that initial step look like? The initial step was a little complex because of the legal requirement. So we had to tread carefully and we did. And so it was, it was a fairly slow ramp up for the first couple of years for that reason, primarily. But we had some capital resources that we had vested in the company and enabled us to get through that period, waiting for th- those sorts of issues to resolve themselves. Probably five years in is when we really started getting momentum as an organization. But it takes it takes some time as a startup. It just does. So when I transitioned, I was an advisor for seven years. And a few years ago, I transitioned over into the consulting space. And similar to you, I got into the industry right after college. So I mean, outside of my, you know, camp counselor jobs and, you know, bussing tables and I had a boat detailing and repair business through high school and college. It was really the only real job that I ever knew. So when I transitioned over into the consulting space, I know personally, I had a multitude of emotions, you know, going through my head, ranging from excitement, right, to fear, to confidence, to self-doubt, and a variety of other things that were, you know, going through my mind. When you made that transition to be independent and, and on your own, what were some of the emotions that you had experienced during that transition? Well, fear is a good one. You know, I had just had my first child, my oldest son was born in December of 92. And we started the firm in June of 93. Was your wife excited about you making the leap? Nothing that that I've accomplished. I met my wife at Penn State and and she's been with me the entire ride and has been an integral part in sort of the support system. And she's always taken the, the view that, you know, if I thought it was a good idea, she would ask her questions, but then we would just plow forward. And so that's what we did. And she was incredibly supportive, as difficult as it was in those early days with a newborn. Probably if I had known how difficult it was going to be, it might have changed how I went about doing it, honestly. But sometimes, you know, not having a full understanding of of the risks that you're going to take, as long as they're directionally correct, is probably a good thing because you may not have taken the risk had you known. So with the fear emotion, let's noodle on that for a little bit. I'm sure it was, you know, fear of, you know, failure was probably one of them. I know for me, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome, which I think could be also categorized under that fear umbrella. What were some of the things that you did to either suppress that fear or get over it tactically? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And I would say, you know, as an entrepreneur, you are definitely in this category. You know, you can't let fear rule you. You have to to overcome it in one way or another, or else you get into a situation where you make no progress whatsoever. So the fear was overwhelmed by the emotion of doing the right thing. We knew we were on the right path. We knew we were doing the right thing for our clients, and that created the energy and the power that you needed to get past the fear. And so we took sort of that energy and put it into the development of the messaging and the structure 
of the organization so that we could, in our heart of hearts, sit down with a client and know that we were offering them something that was better. And, you know, if you've ever, for those folks that listening that have ever started a company and been successful doing it, that has to be part of the DNA. I, I've shared this story before on a podcast that I was on for a company called Reminder Media. Their podcast name is Stay Paid. And speaking about imposter syndrome specifically, and what made me think of it is what you mentioned about obviously not letting fear rule you, but also knowing in your heart of hearts that you really want to help and give and help fulfill that larger vision, not just for yourself, but for the person that you're trying to serve. So one of my friends early on in my career, I had had a conversation with him and he said, Hey, no offense, but you know, if you're sitting across from someone who's making a million dollars and you're not, and they've been on this earth longer than you, how are you able to add value? Like what, what makes you qualified? There's a little bit of a, a shot to my ego initially. And then I thought back as to what got me to that point. And what I started doing early on was I would approach those folks and basically just say, hey, give me a chance. Let me help you for free and let me know if, if this stuff is good or not. And through their feedback, I was gaining additional confidence. So I don't want to be too assumptive, but what were some of the, uh, I'm sure some of the clients and prospects comments towards you and the work that you do were positive to the extent that it built confidence for you to really accelerate your growth. I guess, what were some of those things that reassured you that you were on the right track? Like most trusted advisors, you have certain folks that you had developed a close relationship with because you're helping them with their issues and you know, you're being authentic and you're you're asking for their advice as you go along anyway. So when we formed the company, there were a number of those clients that I had the good fortune of having the ability to go to and be totally straightforward. This is what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, this is this is what we see is wrong with the industry. This is what we're trying to do, and this is how we're going to do it. What do you think? And get their feedback and incorporate it into how we delivered the service, et cetera. So that gave me a lot of confidence knowing that. There were a number of really successful people that I could go to and enlist their help basically as informal advisors to the firm, sort of a board of directors on an informal basis. Without them, I don't know that we would have had the success that, that we had over the years. I feel like oftentimes folks, not just in our industry, but in general, struggle with enlisting help from others because they have a sense of wanting to make folks think that they have it all figured out. And I think it takes a suppression of ego, um, a degree of vulnerability and, and transparency to be able to solicit the feedback necessary and, and be susceptible to constructive feedback as well, but also feedback that reaffirms that you're you're on the right track. I'm sure that there was a nice mix of feedback that you got ranging from constructive to affirmative as you were soliciting that feedback. Yeah, that's right. I, I think, um, well, there's two things I should say. In those days, it was the conflict in the brokerage industry, as we saw them, were not unknown to the sophisticated client. Everybody understood that there's potentially some conflict there based on how people were compensated. So we were confident that when we went to these individuals and said, we've reinvented this model, or we've at least participating in the reinvention of this model, right, as an organization, that they would get it. And so we knew we had high confidence that we were on the right path. But what was really reassuring is that when we described that path to these trusted folks, the reaction was universally positive. And that's a pretty good indicator. And they had no ax to grind. In, in essence, what we were doing, David, which is the second thing I wanted to mention is we were kind of employing the Dan Allison methodology before I knew Dan Allison. And so that's one of the reasons why when we met him, Subsequent years, you know, what, 20 years later, his message rang so true. His methodology made so much sense to us because we had actually already had some less sophisticated version of that in place. And for those of you who may not have heard about Dan Allison, just to give you some brief context, so he's been a speaker in the industry for probably, I think, 18 years or so now. And he's one of the most dynamic speakers and also just like a really fun dude. We text pretty much every day and he's now a managing partner here uh, over at Model FA. And essentially what he helps advisors do is get referrals from their clients in a comfortable way. And it really follows 
kind of three main categories where it's soliciting feedback. And there, even if you just stop there, there's a ton of value because clients are going to share with you what you should double down on across the board throughout your entire client book. And they're also going to give you some constructive criticism so that you can continuously evolve and improve as it relates to your client service and experience and things along those lines. You know, he then goes into making sure that you're always exposing your clients to all of the services that you provide. Let's say hypothetically, you know, you've helped them with their retirement distribution planning and there's someone in their world that, you know, just had a baby and needs some insurance and and needs, you know, the accumulation of of retirement or, or help with the accumulation of retirement, I should say. They may not think to introduce you to that person because they didn't necessarily experience that from you because they were just at a different stage of life. And the third component is, you know, going about soliciting referrals. So that that's what uh, Chaz was just referring to. Now, let me ask you this, Chaz. So before the deal with Madeira, uh, share with me at the peak of Independence Advisors, what was the amount of assets that you guys uh, successfully accumulated over that over that period of time? Well, I, I guess that would be the day before we merged. So that, that was about somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half billion dollars, 1.5. Okay. So $1.5 billion. And I feel like there's different checkpoints as you're building a book of business. I feel like it's, you know, zero to a hundred million, a hundred yep. to 250, 250 to 500, and then 500 to a billion and a billion and beyond. And there's various challenges along the way, I guess, over that journey from essentially zero to a billion and a half dollars, what were some of the challenges that you had experienced throughout that journey? Well, there's certainly, there's a lot. That's a long period of time, 20 28 years, 27 years. So one of the most important evolutions, I would say, that was probably born of challenge was the evolution from a very investment-centric organization to one that was more planning-centric than investment-centric. And it was important for a number of reasons, but most importantly, from our perspective, it was important because we wanted to make sure we were delivering the investment solution that made the most sense for the client. And the the best way to put that into context was was through planning. So we developed planning process about midway through that 27 years. And, And I'm sure that added tremendous value to the firm, but also it added value to the firm, I believe, because it added value to the client relationships. And it enabled us to a focus on what really was important, which was, you know, where they're headed, what they're trying to accomplish, how they're going to get there and use the investment portfolio as the engine for that plan. So the transition from investment centric over to financial planning, talk to me about some of the human capital uh, management challenges over that period of time. Cause obviously the scale to a billion and a half, I'm sure the team changed from, you know, the initial, you know, you and a partner and a couple other folks. So what were some of those challenges like? It was three of us in the beginning and uh, we ended with you know, by and large, including part-time people, 13 or so. Mm -hmm. So the reason, you know, the challenges that were associated with that were number one, if you're going to run an organization that says that has as few participants in terms of employees as ours did, you have to make sure that each one of those folks is at the top of their game, right? They have to be really good quality people. And the way you do that, in my view, was to continuously reinvest in them. And so we took a little different approach than some organizations take, which is we we tried to elevate every position. We knew we could get the clerical sort of work done through Schwab, which is, was our primary custodian. So I searched for those people that, or we searched for those people that we thought had the most, the best ability to evolve in their responsibilities mm-hmm. and leverage the service model for the clients and keep the costs in line, which is really important for all, so that we could continue to deliver the high level of client service that clients have become accustomed to. You had mentioned continuously reinvesting in your team. How did you do that? Is that courses and classes for them? Is that happy hours? Is that you know a nice new desk? Like, How do you actually go about reinvesting in the, in the team? <laughs> yeah. When I talk about reinvesting, I'm talking about designations, et cetera. So we encouraged all of our client service advisors, we you know, encouraged them to get their registered paraplanner designation, 
they got their Series 65, even though they weren't acting in an advisory capacity. It elevated their understanding of what's going on with portfolios and the legal issues that you have and all the important things that you need to be aware of as, as an advisory firm. But it made client problem solving much more effective because now you have a lot of people in the organization whose radar is up and finely tuned to the kinds of issues that they've learned about as a registered paraplanner or as a Series 65 registered person. And it just added another layer of radar. I mean, it's really what you need to do as an organization is always be in tune with your clients and their needs and their needs are evolving and making sure that you're being responsive to those needs and proactive and having that finely tuned intelligence gathering system is the best way of that I would refer to it. Maybe that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but it's really making sure that as information comes in, in the form of inquiries and phone calls and requests that you have the staff that's available, mm -hmm. that your staff is fine tuned to understand not only what that request is, but what the implication of that request may be. Does it provide an opportunity to improve something in the service model? Is there a threat? Is, you know, that made a huge difference, I believe. You know, and there's, sayings in a, a number of books that I've read where, you know, in order to take care of your customers or clients, take care of your people, right? Your staff. And I feel like as they're getting designated and trained and they evolve, it gives them an uptick in their confidence, which then allows them to serve mm -hmm. the clients better so that they're truly an extension of you and an extension of the experience as opposed to just someone doing administrative oriented stuff, right? They're, they're interwoven into the experience. So pivoting slightly. So one of the things that we're really passionate about, we think it's quite frankly, a necessity so that your marketing and branding is aligned with making sure and ensuring that you're able to scale appropriately, we think it's very important to be able to niche down to a specific group of people. Now, our initial belief was that those niches include not limited to things like the retirement space or you know potentially entrepreneurs and business owners, uh, executives, people in the medical community, things along those lines. And we had the belief up until meeting you that niching based on a particular passion wasn't overly effective, or at least maybe not overly effective, but it wasn't as predictable as those other categories that I just mentioned. So for you, I know that you've had both a lot of success and a lot of fun with your niche. So the niche that you've decided to focus on that has been an outstanding business development tool from my understanding for you is fly fishing. So help me understand, and I'm going to ask a lot of questions around this. Help me understand what initially got you into fly fishing before even, you know, maybe being in business. So let me just backtrack one second and say, before I answer that question, we have had the traditional niches, as you know, as well, we have a, a niche in anesthesia, for example, those work very well because you can leverage the experience with a particular group and become an expert on the issues that that group faces. And it's, and it's intuitively sensible. It just makes intuitive business sense to do that. Fly fishing is a different thing, these sorts of non-business related things. And so I originally got into fishing. I've always been, you know, an outdoorsy person. My my mm -hmm. father would take me into the, the mountains of north central Pennsylvania around Blossburg, where his family was from at an early age. And you know, I remember fishing and hiking and all those sorts of things. And so fly fishing was sort of a natural outgrowth of that. I would always fish when I was a kid, ride my bike to the local streams and I mean, Chester County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. I always liked the piece of it. I always liked being by myself. I'm an introverted person. I'm not an extrovert. So I go recharge on the trout stream. So when it came, the fly fishing sort of niche was an accident, to be honest with you. It was a natural outgrowth of something I love to do with people that I enjoyed and it was just a natural thing for me to offer to clients and friends of the firm or, or whoever, because I enjoyed it. I was passionate about it. I had some experience in it just over the decades that I've fished. I knew where to go, how to fish. I had extra gear. I was So it started with just taking people fishing. I mean, because I liked them. I mean, it wasn't really done for business reasons. It was done just because you know, just because of the experience. It's hard to explain. But what I learned was over time for me to organize that and do it efficiently, I had to create some sort of organization. So we created a fly fishing association 
and it has no rules and, and no membership requirements. You don't have to be a client, that kind of stuff. But we just started organizing events because we liked it. And what, what ended up happening, and this was sort of a probably a natural progression, but you know, when you spend time with somebody that, that you advise on a trout stream or wherever it might be, but in my case, it's a trout stream. Mm-hmm. And you really understand who that person is by you're away with them for a couple of days, staying in a cabin on a stream in central Pennsylvania or Yellowstone Park or wherever you might be. You really understand what makes them tick. And as a result of that, it allows you to deliver advice more effectively because you understand how what their communication style is. There's a certain amount of inherent trust that's built up. They're more likely to take your advice because of the time you've spent with them. At least that's my that's my theory. And it's totally natural. And so enhanced, it was done, it was originally done to spend time with people that I met through business principally, primarily, whose company I enjoyed, who I wanted to share one of my interests with. And it turned into something accidentally that was much bigger than that. And so we started having, you know, dinners once a year, pre-COVID, of course, where we bring a speaker in from Yellowstone Park or wherever it might be to talk about fishing and we'd have a hundred people there and we'd feed them dinner and there'd be no charge. We'd do it just for the love of the sport. You didn't have to be a client. We we, we would never talk about independence advisors mm-hmm. in these dinners. It was there for fishing. That was it. But when you're authentic about something like that, you don't have to talk about, at least in my experience, you don't have to make it a commercial for your company. As a matter of fact, it would kind of be, this is one man's opinion, but it would kind of be distasteful because it's your passion. Like, why would I want to turn my passion into a commercial? I just, I wouldn't do it. It would be inauthentic for me. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, it was, became a very authentic way to meet people. People became interested in what we did as a profession, sort of tangentially to fishing. And it, it was the best thing I ever did. So a couple quick questions to get some data points. And I'd be shocked if you actually like track this. So I'm going to look for, you know, your gut reaction. How many people would you say that you've taken fly fishing were already into fly fishing compared to people that you introduced the sport to? I would say it's, it's more than half had never fly fished before. Okay. And what do you think was the result of your fly fishing passion specifically as it relates to AUM? So of the 1.5 billion, and obviously there's a referral tree that occurs over time. So it's tough to directly quantify it, but what's your gut tell you of the 1.5? What do you think came from your passion? It's hard to say because, you know, some of those, some of those relationships pre-existed fishing, et cetera, but you don't know whether having a better relationship with a client keeps them more attuned to your advice and thereby a client longer. I don't know how to exactly quantify that, but I will say that it's not insignificant. And I would imagine it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of the assets, somewhere in that ballpark, but it's really hard to say. I will say that I never hesitated to sponsor a dinner or a trip to a fly fishing show or whatever else we did. I never worried about the cost because I knew we were either reinvesting in the relationships of existing clients or getting exposure to potential clients, or probably more importantly, just doing the right thing for the sport. The more fishermen you get, the more attention is paid to clean water, the more attention is paid to resources, natural resources. And at the end of the day, that's really what I cared about. I cared about the preservation of resources in the sport of fly fishing, first and foremost. Everything else was a collateral benefit. Hey, Model FAs, I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up work flows and opportunities operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. What I think is interesting is, and I find this a lot in my life specifically, and I think in most people's lives, anytime I'm chasing money, can't find it. Anytime I'm chasing good and trying to be others focused, 
the money just happens to appear at the right time and the right amount. So I'm curious to know, fly fishing has obviously resulted in business, which is great. While fly fishing, you don't really talk about business because you don't want to be disingenuous with why you took them out. Mm -hmm. Um, But as a result of fly fishing, you've probably got an additional wallet share. You know, maybe they brought a friend that ended up becoming clients, or maybe they introduced you to someone, you know, shortly thereafter at some point, you know, in the client relationship. So I guess my question would be the, the example that I would use for myself is if I took someone out golfing, right? You don't want to be the guy at the country club who is just pitching your product and services the entire round. That's a very quick way to all of a sudden, you know, have trouble finding a foursome to, to go out and golf with. So I guess my question is, how how did that transition happen? So if you went out and you hung out with people on a personal basis, how did business actually get brought up and when? Because I feel like a lot of people struggle with when to bring that up or <laughs> exactly. if to bring that up. Yep. So it's resulted in business for you, yet you didn't lead with it. So help me understand what that bridge is. If it was a, a non-existing client, it was totally their call. So I never would, and this is going to be a strong statement, so brace yourself. I would never dishonor the thing I was really passionate about by being aggressive about business as a result of it. If you know what I mean, I, it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for me as a person. It might work for somebody else, but for me, that would undercut the whole reason why I did it in the first place. And it never occurred to me. It's just not my nature. So I would set the table and have a great experience. And if that person wanted to inquire about what we did otherwise, I'm more than happy to help them. I just never, I didn't take that approach. And it was a slower game as a result, Mm -hmm. but it was comfortable for me. And it may or may not work for somebody else, but that's what worked for me. Well, most most of the people who went on a trip or came to a dinner knew knew that this was being sponsored by, you know, one way or the other. They either came as a guest of an existing client. We did some Facebook advertising where people can do due diligence. They can see it was called the Independence Advisors Fly Fishing Association. So we didn't make a mystery of it, right? So we left breadcrumbs if they wanted to do their research, but it was never an in-your-face sort of approach. Mm-hmm. So at what point in the relationship did business come up? Like what, did you just purely wait for them to ask what you did? Like how would they even know to select themselves into what process? I I did what I thought I would want to have done if the relationship was reversed. It just worked really well and it feels good. I don't lose sleep at night thinking I'm twisting somebody's arm or whatever the case may be. It just feels totally natural. Mm-hmm. So we we're I was blessed with the ability to think a little bit longer term than some people are have to think. I never worried about it from a on a short term basis. I was always, always, always playing the long game. Well, what I like about that is, so as you know, in part of our program, uh, we have a system called the exponential relationship system. And the whole idea is so many advisors have to sell a prospect to become a client and they're pitching products, services, pricing, performance, process, all that type of stuff. And what we believe in is getting prospect, I should say, to become a client and want to buy in by strategically and intentionally advancing the relationships, ways in which don't seem like it would be part of a financial advisor's process, right? Oftentimes they're sending a market commentary or they're sharing their process or, you know, maybe a reference and you're advancing the relationship on more of a personal basis and really buying into the idea, which quite frankly, I think is a fact, which no one is going to do business with you if they don't like and trust you first. So you really focused on the like and trust part to begin and then everything else seemed to fall into place from there from a business and revenue standpoint. Well, you know, more importantly than that, David, was the fact that if I didn't form the fly, this is the the honest truth. I realized at some level, if I didn't form a fly fishing association, I wasn't going to get to fish very often because I was building a business, right? Running a business. So this gave me an excuse to spend time with people I really liked doing something I really liked to do that I otherwise probably wouldn't get to do because everything else gets in the way. So it created an excuse. And not for nothing, but every time you went out to do your passion, any expenses incurred, you got to write off too. Well, and anytime you wanted to go out, you know, it's, you were just able to say at home, no, hun, it's, it's, it's for business. <laughs> right, right. Oh, she's, <laughs> she would see right through that. There's, I didn't tell you, but she, we've been together since we were 18 years old. So, so she's, she knows all the tricks. 
But the nice thing is this office I'm sitting in right now is, I don't know, 500 yards away from a class A trout stream. So, you know, you could take somebody came in for a meeting and they showed some interest. You could drive them down there and point the trout out to them. Oh, wow. And say, let's go get them. And then they come back another day and you, you can see them and all oh, you're out in the nice part of the country and, you know, trout, generally speaking, don't live in lousy places. So you go to nice spots to fish and it's peaceful. And there's, there's so much that sport has to offer. So I want to, I want to learn something that's totally off topic as it relates to financial planning and more specifically around fly fishing. So to give you, and I'll be vulnerable here to give you some context, I'm not big into fishing. I'll go, but I want someone to take it off the hook. I want someone to do all that type of stuff. It's not really my cup of tea. So uh, I have no idea of what a class A stream is. Help me understand like what that means in relation to other classes. Well, well, class A would be the highest quality water, natural reproduction of fish. The state of Pennsylvania, you know, rates streams based on the aquatic life in the stream and how well the fish reproduce and just the general habitat. So class A is the best you could have. And Pennsylvania is blessed. I mean, in Center County, where I have a house, which is up where Penn State is, there's, I think there's 32 named fishable trout streams in that county. And most of those streams have a population of wild trout. So give you an idea. Pennsylvania is an incredible resource. Learn something new every day if you ask questions. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so pivoting slightly, I know you're an avid reader, as am I. So I appreciate the fact that you're continuously learning because I think, and I forget who said this saying, I should probably figure that out so I can give them credit, but you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotting. And I think for someone who's had uh, the level of success that you've had, for someone who's been on this earth as long as you have, it's easy to say, I got it figured out. But I feel like you're always trying to learn something new and grow your brain, so to speak. So I know one of the books that we talked about before we started recording that's most fresh in your mind. And for those of you listening, as a reminder, really want to promote learning in the industry and make sure that we're continuously working that muscle. Uh, so it's a book called The Trusted Advisor. Tell me a little bit about that book and why you think others should take a look at it. Like what was the impact that it had on you? Yeah. Well, first it's a must read. It's the first book I came across in the industry and it's really not investment related. It's how to be an advisor in any situation. I came across it in or somewhere around 2001 when it was first published. And uh, I read it and I thought, holy smokes, this book, he's actually articulating what I'm doing, but it's much better. It's a much better articulation. It makes a lot more sense when you read it. And he actually quantified some things and created some formulas. But the idea is that in order to enter into a trusted relationship with a client and reach the pinnacle, which is you know really being a trusted advisor, it requires you to take some risk. It requires risk-taking, risk-taking in the relationship risk-taking that you're not going to make the most money in the short run because you're doing the right thing for the client. What's Those an example sort of, or two of risk-taking that you're referring to? Well, let's say you know one of the important concepts in the book is this idea of setting aside the outcome of the meeting, you know, separating yourself from the outcome of the meeting and making that meeting all about that person. So for example, you sit down with a prospective client, don't worry about whether this client fits in your niche or is someone that you can sell an investment portfolio to, figure out what the person's pain point is and help them solve that it, regardless. And if you do that and just put people first all the time, it's like it's like one step above being a fiduciary. A fiduciary is when you implement, you're doing what's in their interest. But this is before mm -hmm. implementation, right? This is like Man, you're a human being. You've given me the courtesy of coming to see me. So and so has referred you, which is how it mostly happens. I'm going to honor that by taking care of you and making sure that when you leave here, you're better off as a result mm -hmm. of this interaction. That's all I care about. And when you do that, that builds trust, right? Because you're taking a risk. You're investing your time with that individual, mm -hmm. cost free to make sure that you're you're setting them on the right course, even if it doesn't mean them working with you or even if it means them not working with you in the future. And that's an example of what I mean by taking risk. You're taking risk with your time. It's so important and so counter to how most people go about mm -hmm. trying to grow their business. I'm a firm believer, if you can get your head around it and become comfortable with those concepts, you'll become a better advisor. And as a result of being a better advisor, you will grow your business faster. And it's extremely powerful. 
So he talks about the importance of intimacy, which is really getting into the nitty gritty of what the issue is with the client, not I need to earn 9% rate of return. What's driving that? Why do you need to earn it? What are you trying to achieve? What's important to you about money? What responsibilities do you feel? What's your biggest worry? All the sorts of things that are more touchy-feely than the numbers, but enable you to offer better advice and achieve that level of being a trusted advisor. Are you the person that they call when the chips are down? That's who you want to be. I agree. I I couldn't agree more. I feel like oftentimes advisors and people in an advisory capacity, regardless of the profession, right? Someone who you know gives advice for a living. I think oftentimes they can get stuck in trying to like fill out a checklist so that they can be prepared to, you know, show them something, whatever that something is, you know, to monetize it. And I feel like when you take the approach that you just mentioned, th- they can feel that, right? And there, there's another book. I don't know if you've read this one by Tony Shea called Delivering Happiness. It's probably one of my most uh, recommended books. It's one of the first books that I read when I started reading again. And essentially, if I you know sum it up in, in a phrase, it's make sure that every time someone comes across you, they feel like it's their birthday, right? Think about the, you know your birthday when everyone's reaching out to you, you just, you feel on top of the world, you feel like people care and it's an awesome feeling. And, right, and right. in addition to that, you mentioned the word intimacy, right? Really trying to understand, you know, the issues or the opportunities at hand, you know, with that client. I feel like intimacy also works in the other direction where a lot of advisors want that professional feel. And there's a wall up between their professional and their personal life. And therefore, you become somewhat unrelatable. And I think the prospect of the client is less likely to really like you as a human outside of an advisor. Take your advice. If you're a subject matter expert, which is one of the stages on the way to being a trusted advisor, you know, we all started out as subject matter experts. And we thought, that I'm going to wow these people with my knowledge. And I'm going to come in there and I'm going to show them, talk about Roth conversions and all this kind of cool stuff, which is important. Don't get me wrong. But you hang your hat on the technical. What I've found is that you reach a point where the technical is table stakes. Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's expected. Mm -hmm. But what's not expected is your ability to develop that relationship so that you can put the technical to work in the most effective way for that client. That's what separates the trusted advisor, in my view, from just a a transactional subject matter expert. It's really reaching a point where you can pull from the quiver that technical and really precisely put that in place for that client because you understand their situation so well. And um, that's scary for some folks to try to make that evolution. Well, I also think too, when you connect with them on that human level outside of the technical aspect, performance, process, whatever. It makes the relationship that much more sticky because inevitably over a 20 or 30 year relationship, there's going to be a point in time where something gets messed up, whether it's logistical or administrative in nature, whether it's you know performance and those people, if they have that personal bond with you, yep. they're that much less likely to make a transition and be forgiving if you're transparent and vulnerable along the way with whatever that mishap actually was. Uh, Whereas if you're just the financial advisor, they're going to go and find another financial advisor. But if you're Chaz, they're not going to go and find another Chaz because they like you as a human. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's good for business and it's good for business because it's good for the client. Mm -hmm. One of my clients and mentors always says to me, uh, you want to do well by doing good. You don't want to do well by jamming people into products that they don't need or whatever that which happens too often in our industry. You want to do well. Everybody does. It's just some people haven't been shown the way Mm -hmm. to do it. And the trusted advisor book really helps, could really help open your eyes to a really legitimate way of doing this from a really well-respected guy, by the way, Charlie Green, who was a phenomenal uh, speaker. Matter of fact, you mentioned the podcast. I just recorded a podcast with Charlie about this topic. And so it just was published yesterday, the day before at uh, MadeiraWealth.com. So on the website, it's also on Spotify and Apple podcast, Google podcasts and all that stuff too. All the usual suspects. Oh, cool. Well, Chaz, this has been very insightful for me. It's been, I've learned some new things. I think it's affirmed some things as well, which makes me happy. And you just mentioned Madeira. If people want to follow along with your personal journey, I know you're on a variety of social platforms. You know, where can they find you if they want to connect? Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, 
all the all the again all the usual uh you know suspects cool um and those will be uh in the show notes as well so if you can't find them just scroll down a little bit on whatever platform you're listening to this on and there'll be links to all those social profiles so before we wrap up and head into the after hours portion a couple asks that we have for listening to this episode hopefully you found it to be valuable i know i did So if you found it valuable, click the share button, uh, share it with someone either in the industry or outside the industry. I feel like there are some industry specific stuff, but also industry agnostic stuff. So feel free to share this, give them a reason to listen to it. Don't just share the link. The second ask that we have is it would really help for overall visibility if you left us a review on iTunes. And if you go ahead and do that, just screenshot that and shoot me a text at 978 228 two three three eight again that's nine seven eight two two eight two three three eight what will happen is you'll get an automatic reply the link to enter in your contact information and i'll then get notified that that screenshot was sent do me a favor and just write chas c-h-a-s along with that text message and what i'll do as a thank you is give you access to dan allison's methodology uh, that we had talked about earlier in this episode it's a couple videos that if you actually implement it, it will totally change your business and you'll experience some growth. But the key thing is to actually implement it and implement it consistently. I know a lot of folks have trouble with that. So (laughs) there's your friendly nudge to do so. So with that being said, we're going to head into the after hours portion. But for now, Chaz, I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. That was great. I feel like oftentimes advisors need to be reminded to humanize themselves, figure out a way to align their profession with their passion, but also not blur those lines too much to where your passion dissipates over time. Because if you intertwine it too much and you're too aggressive in those moments, you can start to despise it because it may not be as effective as you had originally planned. Or if you do it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Like for in fly fishing, for example, if I did it be- and the principal reason was to generate business, it would it would lose its appeal really quickly, and it wouldn't be as fun because you know you're, it, you're you can't unplug it all during the you know the activity that no, you're able I, to. I unplug. love going on these trips. These I love going on these trips and doing these events with people because it's you know it's just let's go fishing, let's go have a good time, um, let's mm-hmm. have experience together that. You know, it's going to, it's going to be memorable and, and maybe for you, the first time you ever did this and maybe it'll change your life. Maybe it'll give you something that you can do down the road. And a lot of successful people are looking for things to do when they retire. And there's few things better than fly fishing from this seat. And, uh, that's, that's my two cents. Cool. Well, I will say that once it warms up, because I'm now in sunny Florida, so I'm, I'm a baby when it comes to cold temperature now, uh, but when it warms up, if you take me fly fishing, I'll take the fish off the hook myself. I'll get over my fears of doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's it trout have teeth, but you know, they're not big. So there's no worries there. And and um I'd be delighted to take you. Awesome. Uh tell me about um so 1.5 billion in AUM over your career. What's the biggest client that you've served as it relates to total net worth? Very significant. I, I don't want to say the number just because it's it's very large. You know, just from a from a privacy standpoint, I think just I've been blessed servicing some really, really significant situations. And, you know, I think that comes from just always doing the right thing for the client and and doing what you said you were going to do. Well, there's a couple of things. Being transparent, mm-hmm. doing what you said you were going to do, taking risk on behalf of the client. I don't mean in the portfolio. I mean, not being worried about pennies shortcut, and then always detaching from the outcome. Forget about what it means for you. How are you going to make this person's life better? That's all that matters. Love it. So I'm going to include your wife in this, but I also want to know who else in your world has been one of your biggest cheerleaders to make sure that you're continuing to persevere. Things got hard and maybe it tripped and fell a handful of times. So share with me who in your world has always been there by your side from the beginning uh, to help you persevere through some of the tough times? Well, I, I would have to say, you know, my mother, you know, I lost my dad when I was really young. And so she set an example of, of just unbelievable hard work. And, 
and perseverance through really difficult times. And, and so she provided a phenomenal example for myself and my brother and sister. And, and then I've been blessed to have a series of mentors in my career uh, and friends, one in particular that just in a very non-aggressive way, but in a very supportive way, was always there to provide encouragement and to make sure that I realized the value that I was bringing to the table and just a tremendous influence on me, you know, in the last 15 years or so, it made a, made a huge difference. If it hadn't been for this individual, I don't know that I would have ever done the transaction to buy out my partner. And it was helpful in the, in the Modera transaction as well, just from a support standpoint. And so we're all sort of a composite of all these positive, and sometimes we're composite of negative people, but I think we're, I, I like to believe that if we're getting better all the time, that we're a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person. You are your own authentic self, right? You are, you are the result of all these interactions. And, you know, if you have an experience, good or bad, and you don't learn from that experience and incorporate that experience one way or the other into the next version of yourself, I'm on Chaz version 2728, you know, 0.6, whatever the net, you know, the, you're, you're missing, you're just missing an opportunity. It's just so I think the temptation is to sort of get into a rut and do the things that you always did and behave the way you always behaved. And I try, my wife, Laura would say, maybe I don't try hard enough all the time, but I try to get better all the time and improve, improve my communication skills and, Mm -hmm. and these things um, that, that are all important to all of us. It's just life is too short just to sit there on your hands. I agree. Last question to round us out. You've met with a lot of people. You've also uh, spoke on stage a number of times uh, throughout the world, actually. You had mentioned when you were talking to Pat and I a while ago, I think you had uh, done some speaking Germany as an example. And I know that I've been on this earth uh, a little bit uh, less than you. I have a bunch of uh, embarrassing experiences throughout my career. I'm curious to know if you would be so kind as to uh, share an, an embarrassing experience of yours throughout your career. Sure. I'll share one that, that was embarrassing. <laughs> the, reluct- the reluctant sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, right. I will share this because it ties together a couple of things that we've talked about. And you just mentioned Germany. It'll take me a couple minutes to, to set the stage for this, but I think it'll be worth it. Cool. So let's go. A number of years ago, 2012, I think it was, I was asked by Dave Butler at Dimensional to mm-hmm. uh, consider going to Germany to speak to German advisors because the German advisory industry is about continues to be some some period of time behind ours. Some would say 10 years, some would say 20. And I've always liked the idea of going to Germany. I, I grew up speaking a little bit of German in uh, learning a little German in school. So I said, sure. And then I realized I'd gotten myself in real in the deep end of the pool, right, without water wings. And so I decided to go back with my wife, Laura, and every Saturday for nine months, we took German lessons. We had a tutor, and she was awesome, a real taskmaster, task master, native German. <laughs> you had to be there on time. We were there for three hours. You know, it was full bore. Uh, no mistakes, no, no, no tolerance for any error. And she was unbelievable. And so we spent nine months getting my German back mm-hmm. up to speed, good enough that I could stand in front of a group and make my presentations in German because it's, that's a big deal. So we developed these slides and they were awesome. I mean, really, and we practiced and practiced and practiced. And so the point of time came, I flew to Dusseldorf and there's a hundred German advisors out there in the audience and they're buttoned up. I mean, these these folks had their acts together. Every It was run by Dimensional. And if you have any experience with Dimensional, any of the listeners, you know that everything they do is, is really well orchestrated. So everybody had a tablet with a pen at a certain angle with two mints, you know, a chair is like two inches from the edge of the table. My time comes to speak and I step up on stage and my uh, host, who I've become very good friends with, named Christoph Kanzler. Christoph introduces me to the audience in German and uh, I... <laughs> I, uh, I he accept his invitation and inclusion of the introduction. I tell a joke and it was a story about my family and essentially, and this isn't the embarrassing part, but I'll tell you just because it's funny. My grandmother took us to the wrong country when I was growing up to see where our ancestors were from. She took us to Holland, but my, our ancestors were from Germany. She just had read that they came from Rotterdam. That's where they got on the boat. 
it's not they look took an ox cart or something from Rhineland Falls over to Rotterdam and, and sailed over to the US. They weren't from Holland, but we spent a week in Holland. It was awesome, but we went to the wrong country. It turns out. You no, know, we did go on a boat, but it was, I mean, it was, it's just funny. After my grandmother died, we learned, well, we went to the wrong country. But if you knew my grandmother, you would think, wow, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Cause she was, she was crazy, funny. And just, that would have been something my grandmother did. But at any rate, so I tell this story in German, they love it because it, it fits perfectly with their vision of Americans where we went to the wrong country. We, we know we're from Europe somewhere, but we, we ended up going to the wrong spot. So I started my slides. And I'm in about the third slide and the the projector breaks, or I did something wrong. I'm blaming the projector, but I probably hit the wrong button. And I realize I can't make the next slide. And you understand that I practiced this for nine months. So if I don't go to the next slide, I'm in deep trouble because my German is okay, but it's not good enough to ad lib the rest of the presentation. So under my voice, under my breath, uh, because I'm I'm mic'd up, I said a minor curse word in German. I won't say it mm-hmm. now, but it's, you would know it. <laughs> and uh, it went out over the entire auditorium. And there was this moment of panic where I realized, oh my God, it was like the Lord saying this curse word from outer space, you know, through this auditorium. And I looked up sort of sheepishly and they went. Well, because bananas. you said it in so German was, too, exactly. so they can relate. So, so I was embarrassed <laughs> for about um, you know, two seconds. And then I was a superhero. They thought it was the greatest thing that ever occurred. It was totally authentic. Right. So that checks that box. Humanized, humanized you. me. Um, it was funny in, in the context of what was going on. And since ever since then, I've gone back every year since then on sometimes on a couple occasions, I've developed great friendships in Germany. I love that country. So that embarrassing moment on my debut presentation to a hundred advisors. And since then I've spoken to thousands. I don't know what the number is, but it's a large number was uh, embarrassing for a few moments and then turned into a, a legendary story. So sorry for the long winded explanation, but, but you had to have the context. <laughs> Love it. Well, I'm glad you got to, uh, through your speaking, got to visit the country that you actually came from through all this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was a, it was a side benefit. But uh, it turns out now we have goddaughters in Hamburg. We've got, you know, we've got friends in all the major cities. That's cool. And it's, it's, it's been, it's been a tremendous experience. So taking risk, right? Love it. Well, that's been a tremendous experience. This episode has been a tremendous experience. Our relationship uh, to me has been a tremendous experience. So I appreciate the time spent. I appreciate your advocacy for us. I appreciate your friendship from afar. And I appreciate in advance going fly fishing with you here in the near future. So thank you for all of that. (laughs) Well, that will happen. And you're very, very welcome. It's been, uh, uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you and Patrick and the rest of the organization. So um, you guys do a really good work. And if there's any other way I can help you, please let me know. Awesome. Thank you for that. For those of you who stuck around for the after hours portion, appreciate your time. And Chaz, thank you again. We'll, uh, we'll be talking soon. Sounds good. Have a good day, David. Take care. You too.